So I'm a professional archaeologist from Colorado who tends to work more in the field. Now for some background, the modern nomenclature for archaeology is cultural resource management. The work often involves contracting with engineering firms or government agencies, like the Bureau of Land Management or Forest Service, to survey project areas that are in danger of being impacted by development or natural hazards like a fire. Generally, the first stage of field deployment is pedestrian survey. So we basically go out and look around for evidence of sites on the surface. We record what's there and we move on. This kind of work ends up taking you to remote places, parts of the world most people just don't go. My first job was with a smaller mom and pop firm that won a contract with a large company out of Texas that wanted to put a natural gas pipeline through an area known as the Canyon of the Ancients National Monument. Now anyone who knows anything about cultural resource laws can tell you this was a very bad idea on the part of the guys from Texas. But what ended up happening was my firm hired on a significant contingent of archaeological technicians to field seven crews surveying and recording a 20,000 acre project area. So for the first year I worked there and I learned a lot saw a ton of amazing archaeology, and got to know the area very well. I had done well enough my first season to get an invite back the following to join the first crew they sent back out into the field. We deployed in February to pick up some of the southern ends of the project area, which took us very far out near the border of Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico, known as the Four Corners. Now, the most common site type in the area is what we in the field refer to as a lithic scatter. These are collections of stone tools and associated manufacturing debris. The common locations for these are on mesa tops as they provide good views of the area and flat surfaces on which to hang out. The three of us on the crew came up on one of these and we started pin flagging artifacts to understand the extent of the scatter. I was working closer to my friend Tyson as we rambled around the site when we came up on this large, desiccated bird carcass. As I said, we've been in the area for a year, and I have a background in biological anthropology as well as a general background in bone identification. This bird was not something that naturally lives in the area. After a few minutes of checking this thing out, we determined it was a chicken a formerly plump, domesticated chicken that had been eviscerated with a clean cut from beak to navel. For clarification, there are farms in this area, but we are extremely far away from them, and this bird had not been killed by a predator. We also noted that other than having its innards ripped out, it hadn't been scavenged in any way, just gutted and untouched. We are in the desert. Anything that dies gets picked clean by everything around. But this thing was just dried out by the sun. After a bit of, well, that's weird, and how the hell did it get all the way out here? We got back to work flagging artifacts and recording the site. But a few steps later, I found another one. The exact same thing. A chicken, gutted and mummified, left alone. Then Tyson calls over to me that he found another one too. As we went along, we found another and another and another. All told, we found roughly 30 eviscerated chickens spread out across this prehistoric site in the middle of nowhere. Well, oddity aside, we were still trying to record this site and talking about how weird this was when our boss who was looking for architecture on the cliff edge calls over if you guys think that's weird, come and look at this. We walked over to find him standing on the boulder looking down just below the cliff edge at the base of a tall juniper. I will never forget when I looked over the cliff edge to find a severed six point bull elk head wired to the base of the tree, pointing due east towards a standing geological feature known as a ship rock. The elk head, like the chickens, was untouched slack-jawed, tongue hanging out. We all just stood there for a minute staring at this thing before we noticed the smell. 
So to the north of this severed head was a small collapsed structure made out of juniper sticks. Laid against the cliff edge and this rank rotten smell emanating out of it. At this point we were all a little bit sketched out by all of this. So nobody dared to look in that little structure. We recorded the site mentioned the strange animals in the site form which is officially filed in the state archaeological database and went on with our survey. I got laid off later in that season when the client realized they couldn't do the project without extensive mitigation costs. Since I have traveled all over the West and worked in some of the most remote places the country has to offer and I have never seen anything like what I saw that day. A Navajo co-worker once told me that it was related to witchcraft in the region. A few others offered the explanation that meth is a hell of a drug. I don't know what that was, but it was spooky as hell. Stay safe out there, folks. This happened when I was a ranger at the Allegheny National Forest. The smallest campground, Minister Creek, only had one family staying, so I thought I would leave them be and just do an early morning patrol before the end of my graveyard shift. It was June 2015, and it was around 11 p.m. when I went outside to sweep off the front ranger station when the phone rang inside. I didn't make it the first time, but that was fine because whoever it was called right back. When I picked it up, a man was yelling on the other end of the phone. I asked the man to calm down and repeat everything to me. He was from the family at Minister Creek, and he had claimed that he had seen a Bigfoot behind their camp watching them, and they were afraid to even try and leave. It sounded silly to me, but I wanted to do my job, so I told him I'd be right over, and I hung up. It wasn't a long drive, and when I got there, the whole family had just been holed up in one of their tents together hiding. I announced myself, and the man on the phone came out. He was visibly shaken. I asked him to describe what he saw. He said that he was out for some air with his son when he heard something in the woods. He looked over to see what it was and saw this huge figure walking on two feet behind their camp. He said that it had reddish brown hair all over its body. No shirt or pants, just fur. I asked him what made him think it was Bigfoot. Well, he said that when it reached the end of their camp lights where there was a fire pit and a picnic table, it turned around to look at them, and its eyes were glowing green. I didn't believe any of it at first, and asked if it could have been a black bear. He seemed convinced enough, so I decided to take a look around with my flashlight. The man was convinced that this thing was still there. I headed towards the tree line, and I shined my flashlight on it. At first, I saw nothing, but then there they were. Two green eyes staring at me. Then its whole figure came into view. This creature was about seven feet tall and very muscular, covered in this long brown reddish hair just like the man described with a white chest and belly. I could see it breathing heavily as if it was angry or something. The most terrifying part of this whole thing that its face looked almost human, but its eyes were so weird. They also shined like they were wet, reflecting light back to me. I stood there until the creature started walking away from me, keeping an eye on me as it went backwards into the brush. I backed away too, very, very slowly, waiting for this thing to take its eyes off me. It eventually did, and I turned and went back to the campers. Calmly, I suggested I help them clear out and escort them to their car, and they obliged. I even drove them to the exit of the park. We shut down that campground for a week to investigate further, but nothing was ever found. In 2004, John Mayfield worked at the pawn shop in Mount Airy, Tennessee. On Wednesday, November 17th, he got off work at 3 p.m. and headed home. At the time, he lived near Cagle Community Church in a pretty remote area. When he got home, he noticed these giant paw prints next to his driveway that led into the woods behind his house. He didn't have a dog and there were no neighbors, so this was very strange to him. He decided to call his friend who lived in the area and he told him about it. So his friend came over and they both went out to check it out. 
The prince led to the woods for a bit and then they stopped right at a creek that was running pretty high due to the rain earlier in the week. He said he followed them for about a hundred yards or so and lost them after they crossed the creek. His friend suggested that maybe a bear made these tracks, but John said those aren't bear tracks. And besides, these tracks look like they had been made by something walking on two legs, not four. It was about 4.30 and this time of year it was starting to get dark. John's friend suggested they start heading back because they didn't have any flashlights with them. That's when they heard it. This faint growling sound coming from across the creek. They both looked at each other and John's friend said, I'm out of here. And took off running back towards John's house. But before John turned to follow his friend, he scanned the woods across the creek and he saw this large, dark figure standing there. He started slowly walking backwards towards the edge of the tree line while he kept his eyes on this thing. He couldn't really make out any features, but it stood as tall as him, probably taller. He saw it go to the edge of the creek, like it wanted to jump over it towards him, but the creek was at least 30 feet wide at this point. That's when John realized that this thing was calculating how far it had to jump to clear the creek. John immediately turned and ran back towards his house. He called the sheriff and reported what he had seen. They looked at the tracks, but they never found anything. John moved to Kentucky a few years after that, but he still thinks about seeing that giant creature in the woods. Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve occupies the northmost section of the southeastern Alaska coastline between the Gulf of Alaska and Canada. In late September of 1985, Kevin Robert O'Keefe went hiking and camping in this vast wilderness and never returned. O'Keefe was an enthusiastic outdoorsman who had been living in Sacramento, California. He had a lot of experience in the wild and he had been planning a trip to Glacier Bay National Park for quite some time. Not only had he taken several survival courses prior to arriving at the park, but he also had taken enough supplies to sustain him in the wild for up to a month. Arriving in the city of Juneau on September 20, 1985, O'Keefe's plan, like many other people before him, was to distance himself from technology and civilization for a while by escaping into the Alaska wilderness, so he could reconnect with nature and find some peace away from the modern world. While this meant that O'Keefe would not be keeping in contact with his wife for the two weeks he was away, the 36-year-old did inform park rangers about his plans. In two days after arriving in Juneau, he took a float plane to the Muir Inlet in Glacier Bay to establish a base camp. On October 8th, two park rangers were patrolling the area around Wolf's Point, near to where O'Keefe had informed them he would be staying, and found the young man's tent with the zipper closed and some of O'Keefe's personal belongings and gear strewn about his campsite. O'Keefe had specifically told people that he would be doing day hikes and not spending the night anywhere other than his campsite. He was not due to return to Juneau for another two days, and so the park rangers assumed that he was out on a hike. Alarm bells began to ring the following day, when the park rangers returned to find the campsite exactly how they left it, with no sign that anyone had slept in the tent the previous night. They also discovered that the center pole of the tent was broken. After contacting Alaskan state troopers, as well as relatives of the young hiker, park rangers conducted a search for O'Keefe. Although they did not find any signs that could lead them to his current whereabouts, they did find items like his sleeping bag, backpack, and food at different locations in his campsite, indicating that he probably had not gone out for one of his day hikes. They also managed to find a pair of boots, a hat, and a glove liner, which likely belonged to him down in a gully away from the campsite. Surviving freezing temperatures of Alaska at that time of year would have been next to impossible without the things that the rangers found. The search continued for another two weeks and involved over 100 park rangers, but no sign of O'Keefe was ever found. Perhaps the strangest part of his disappearance 
was the copious amounts of food found at his campsite the first two days of the search, which apparently no animals had come to scavenge in that time. The Chugach National Forest in South Central Alaska covers almost 7 million acres of glaciers, forests, shorelines, and rivers, and within this expanse lies the peak of Mount Marathon. Every year on the 4th of July, there is a three-mile mountain race that begins and ends in the city of Seward. The halfway point is a stone marker on Mount Marathon. It was here in 2012 that a man named Paul Michael Lemaitre went missing in broad daylight and never to be seen again. Paul was from Anchorage and was running the race for the first time that year. Described by his family as an adventurous spirit and very physically fit, he had won the lottery to earn a spot in the race, and the 66-year-old grandfather and businessman had been eager to compete, having completed a 12K event just a month earlier. The race itself is considerably grueling. Starting in downtown Seward, racers run a half a mile to the bottom of Mount Marathon, then climb almost 3,000 vertical feet straight up cliffs and mud and shale before getting to Race Point, an artificial summit point. The participants then go downhill over snow fields and rock fields and waterfalls and crags until they reach the finish line back on the streets of Seward. The weather that day had been rainy and foggy, leading to slick conditions, and Paul was in last place, lagging behind the main group of the runners in the second wave of the race. Around 5.45 p.m. on the day of the race, a race steward saw Paul ascending to the turnaround point with about 200 feet to go, and after getting his bib number, informed race officials that Paul, the last runner in the race, should be expected home in about an hour and a half. Paul never came down from the mountain. There was no sign of him as night was falling and the rain began to worsen, so his wife made calls to emergency services after which search and rescue teams were dispatched to the mountain. Alaskan state troopers were also called in that night, and during the course of the search, the mountain was scanned by helicopters, which were equipped with infrared radars, while on the ground, up to 60 people scoured the area. Although the official search was called off after four days, Paul's family, aided by firemen, state troopers, and rescue dogs and volunteers, poured thousands of hours into searching for the missing man, all to no avail. Paul's disappearance attracted widespread media coverage at the time as well, but not a single trace of physical evidence was ever found that might lead to the discovering of what happened to him. In an interview on the subject a number of years later, one relative of Paul said, The mountain swallowed this man. 2012 was an unusual year in the Mount Marathon race. In addition to Paul going missing, two other runners were badly injured during the race, one with serious head injuries. In response to Paul's disappearance and the unusually severe injuries suffered by the two other racers, several safety improvements were made prior to the 2013 race. Similar to the famous Bermuda Triangle, in the lesser discussed Michigan Lake Triangle, the Alaska Triangle is an area that has a vast history of odd sightings, strange occurrences, and above all, cases of missing people. The Triangle covers much of Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve in South Central Alaska. And it was here that 55-year-old Richard Lyman Griffiths from Spokane, Washington disappeared in the summer of 2006. Griffiths was an inventor who had grown up in Florida, dreaming of one day living in the wild and remote far north, described by his family as having an active imagination and a curious intellect. He was a big man, about 6 feet 2 and 220 pounds. He had traveled to Rangel to test out an invention of his, a bright orange survival cocoon that would allow him to brave the rugged terrain and harsh weather in the national park. Before taking off, Griffiths told his friends in Florida that he might winter over in Alaska. 
In September 2006, he had been dropped off by the bus along the Alaska Highway and left some of his gear at a lodge near the White River. He told people there that he would be going upriver to McCarthy, an outpost town in Wrangell St. Elias Park, to test out his orange cocoon. This was the last known sighting of Richard Lyman Griffiths. Due to the landscape and the weather in that part of the world, searching for missing people in the wilderness of Alaska is extremely difficult at the best of times. But the search for Griffiths was made even more difficult by two things. The fact that he had not told anyone exactly where he was going, and he was not actually reported missing until almost a year after he was last seen. After a battle with cancer, his family mostly had lost touch with him, and when they contacted the family after he was reported missing, they didn't even know that he was up there. On top of that, search and rescue teams are limited in Wrangell, due to its extreme size and isolation. While the search efforts for Griffiths were hampered by these factors, it was expected that some sightings of the inventor's bright orange cocoon would be found. Such a distinctively colored item would stand out against the landscape of Wrangell, especially when viewed from the air. To this day, not one trace of Griffiths or his survival cocoon has ever been found. 60-year-old Alaska resident John Wipert had been working at a lake lodge inside Kluwani National Park at the headwaters of Beaver Creek. The owner and operator of the lodge, 90-year-old Urban Rahoy, arrived on July 2, 2009 at the lodge with groceries, only to find the property empty and Wipert missing. Wipert had only been working there for a few weeks and had spoken to his boss of wanting to go north to Canada by trekking along the White River. Rahoy later remembered advising him that the Beaver Creek route was far safer. When Rahoy arrived at the empty lodge, he found that Wipert had done some very unusual things before disappearing. He had left bacon in the sink thawing out. By the looks of things, he had been through all the buildings at the lodge, and had even taken the door off the house and cut the hinges in half. He also posted a note at the seasonal hunting operation, saying that he had gone to check on an unmanned cabin and would be back the following night. Wipert had also left a gate at the lodge open, and some of the horses were missing. When he wasn't found in the immediate area of the lodge, searchers speculated that he might have tried to ride west 35 miles to Shushana, a deserted cluster of old mining cabins around an airstrip in the park, or to Beaver Creek in Canada's Yukon, about an equal distance to the east. Routes connecting the lodge to both places were searched, including by search dogs in the Alaskan National Guard troopers and air support teams. But no sign of Wipert or the horses were found, apart from a set of old tracks which may or may not have belonged to Wipert. Rahoy, himself a retired bush pilot, was also involved in the search, and he enlisted the help of several guides from the area. A few weeks after he was reporting missing, however, the search was called off, with plans to search the area again in the fall when the foliage was off the trees, although this search was apparently never carried out. John Wipert was never seen again. Some have speculated on the reasons for Wipert's disappearance with Rahoy, the owner of the lodge in which Wipert had been staying, stating that he believed that the extreme isolation and loneliness had gotten to his employee, perhaps driving him to take the horses and attempt to run away somewhere. This does not, however, explain why Wipert had left a note saying that he intended to return, or why he had performed random operations such as the deconstruction of the door to the house. It was also noted that having taken the two horses together, there should have been more tracks to be found in the area around the lodge but it was as if John Wipert, along with the horses, had just vanished into thin air. Mount Foraker is the second highest peak in the Alaska range after Denali, and it is considered one of Alaska's most difficult climbs, a formidable challenge even for experienced mountaineers. 
In 2006, a New Zealand woman, Karen McNeil, and her friend, Sue Knott, were world-renowned in the field of mountain climbing and were even sponsored by Mountain Hardware. In May of that year, the pair set out to scale Mount Foraker, but unfortunately never came down from the mountain. The pair had hoped to make the Alaskan grade route on Mount Foraker in just 10 days setting out on the 12th of May. They had completed numerous hard mountain routes and ice climbs between them over the years. In 2004, they had climbed Denali's Cassin Ridge together and were forced to camp on the summit in a storm. On May 12th, Knott and McNeil informed Mount Forker's base camp manager that they were departing to climb the infinite spur on Mount Forker. The manager gave them a TRS walkie-talkie type radio with which to contact the base camp once they were up higher on the route. Knott and McNeil said they would call once able and also told the manager that they were carrying 14 days of food as well as several 8-ounce fuel canisters each. Once the pair had departed for the climb, they were never seen or heard from again. Fears for their safety grew after weather conditions on the mountain got worse. Five days of high winds and snow battered the region, and authorities reported avalanche activity on the mountain had been likely. The Denali Park Rescue Team used high-altitude llama helicopters to conduct aerial searches of the mountain along the possible routes that could have been taken by Knott and McNeil. They ended up finding a yellow bag, a black fleece hat, and a pink nylon jacket that belonged to Knott, as well as a ripped backpack and a radio and a sleeping bag, but the missing climbers were not sighted. Search efforts began to be hampered by severe weather on June 7th, and for the next week only one search and rescue flight was possible. It seemed likely to rescue authorities that the pair were forced to continue upwards in the harsh weather, hoping to descend by an easier ridge. It was suspected that they had 14 days of gas to melt the snow and had been without water for at least 10 days by the time the search was scaled back, as the probability of survival was considered extremely low at that point. Possible reasons for McNeil and Knott's disappearance on Mount Foraker have been analyzed extensively by the American Alpine Club. Scenarios such as a fall or being blown off the mountain in a storm were ruled out based on the evidence of their last whereabouts found on the mountain, including some of the tracks that most likely belonged to the pair. In the end, the vanishing of these two highly experienced climbers remains a mystery. German-born Thomas Marco Seibold was living in Wisconsin and decided to travel to Alaska in June of 2012. He wanted to attempt the daring feat of living in the backcountry of the gates of the Arctic National Park by himself. For the previous six years, Seibold had been teaching and training at an outdoor survival school. The survival school teaches American Indian values along with weather forecasting, shelter building, and primitive hunting and gathering techniques, skills which the German native had planned to put in practice in the wilderness of Alaska. While the school's founder, Tamarack Song, described him as an experienced outdoorsman, Seibold was known as something of a wandering spirit and a bit of a risk taker. During an incident at Minnesota Boundary Waters, where he injured his leg with an ax, Seibold almost died while attempting to walk to the nearest emergency services, despite being told by his friend that this would make the wound bleed more profusely. During the winter, Seibold would often spend days or weeks at a time in the forest in primitive handmade shelters of his own design, whilst living off handmade snare line and making his own clothing from animals that he had eaten. In summer, he would often stay out for an entire month at a time in the wilderness and had been doing this for years in the Wisconsin Northwoods. Seibold took a six-month leave absence from his survivalist school in order to make this trip to Alaska, which he began at an Alaskan native fish camp in the southeastern part of the state. From there, he traveled north from village to village whilst living off the land. 
He eventually arrived in late September of 2012. Once he was there, he decided to stay at a cabin in Brooks Range, which belonged to a family that his mentor, Tamarack Song, had put him in touch with. After a few days with this family, he entered the gates of the Arctic National Park and was never seen again. Alaska State Police were alerted when Seibold missed in a November 11th flight from Kobuk that was supposed to begin his return trip to Wisconsin. The rescue operation focused their search near the Ambler River, where they believed Seibold may have built a base camp. At first, rescuers were confident of finding Seibold based on his vast experience in similar extreme northern conditions. Seibold was highly trained in primitive survival skills. His diary was found in a cabin in the park, with a last entry written on October 7, 2012, stating Seibold's intention to go on a days-long trip of exploration, as well as references to wood he had been stockpiling and preparing for the cabin, indicating his intent to return there. Most of his gear had apparently been taken with him, but the rescue team found no clues which might tell them where he had gone. Many planes were enlisted to try to find Seibold, with one eventually spotting a circle drawn on a gravel bar far up the Ambler River. The search and rescue workers wondered if this might have been the O from an SOS sign, but they couldn't be sure, and no evidence of the missing hiker was found in this area. After six flights over 13 days, the troopers suspended their search on November 24th as the temperatures hit negative 35 degrees Fahrenheit. But the search was continued by Seibold's family and friends after they had read about successful rescues of others who survived in the Arctic conditions for up to 49 days without food, equipment, or training. And Thomas had at least some of all three. The family and friends privately hired two bush pilots who were previously employed by the Alaskan state troopers. During the course of the search by friends and family, new clues began to emerge regarding his disappearance. A missing map section that Thomas may have had with him indicated his interest in exploring the headwaters along the Ambler River. It was also revealed that Seibold had been reading a lot about this area. It was also discovered from both his diary and conversations that he had had with others that he was interested in rafting down the Ambler River. Although his diary also stated that he was well aware that the unusually heavy rains in the region at that time of his writing made the idea basically impossible. It was noted from this evidence that Seibold, despite his reputation for being a risk taker, was also clear-eyed about the realities of surviving in the wild and drew on his vast experience as an outdoorsman when making decisions. The search for Seibold drew criticism at the time because of the lack of involvement of the Native American population, who would have had exceptional knowledge of the land. When some of these people eventually came to aid the search, it was only through hearing through the grapevine that someone had gone missing, and not by direct engagement by the Alaskan state troopers. Seibold's disappearance is considered one of the most mysterious disappearances in recent times in Alaska. He was also uniquely cut out to survive in that terrain and climate, as well as the fact that most of the dangerous animals of the park would have been in hibernation at the time he vanished. This first account comes from Tim, who worked at Hot Springs National Park in the late 90s. He had a very strange encounter while working at night. Here's his account. I was working the night shift at the ranger station. I worked at a small park called Hot Springs National Park in Arkansas. And while we were quite busy during the warmer months, the colder ones really had no tourists or hikers. Because of that, I was left to tend to the station alone most nights in the winter, something I actually enjoyed. I was at my desk with a fresh cup of coffee, going over some paperwork from the previous day. It was a dark night, and the lamp was the only thing that lit the main floor of our wooden station. It was the 90s, so we didn't have an upgrade yet at the station. It was pretty cold in there, so I decided to grab some firewood from the pile out front and use the fireplace. 
I dropped everything and ran outside. Outside was pitch black. I could see the faint stars, but that's about it. There were no sounds other than my radio playing from inside. Some classic rock, of course. There was an occasional passing of a car on the highway off in the distance. And a small stream ran behind our station and the runoff from that made splashing noises here and there. I ignored all of this and began picking up the firewood as quickly as I could because the night air was very cold. As I headed back towards the front door of the station, I thought I heard someone run across the floor inside. That was impossible, I thought. I was completely alone in that station and could even see the loft upstairs when I was inside. There's no way anyone got in and hid in there at any point. I headed through the door straight to the fireplace. My back turned to the rest of the room. As I reached for the first piece of wood, I felt this small, cold hand reach down my back and push me forward. I turned around to look, thinking that someone might be there, but sure enough, it was nothing. I continued piling the wood when the hand touched me again, this time my cheek. I jumped up and turned to my right, but again, nobody was there. That's when I heard these footsteps running across the floor to the loft and then the loft ladder came crashing down onto the floor. I stood up quick and looked around the station and it was completely silent. You could hear a pin drop. I began to head towards the ladder and I propped it back up to access the loft. I went into panic mode now, but still didn't want to believe that someone or something was in the station with me. I looked around again, still nothing. That's when I started to climb the ladder and I decided to have a look up in the loft. I kept my radio on and began to ascend the ladder, praying nothing would knock me down. I looked up in the loft and there was nothing there. The rest of my shift, I never felt or heard anything else strange. But over the next three years that I worked there, I had several of those same experiences. This next account comes from Rohan who encountered something his friends warned him about while working at the Pine Barrens in 2012. Here's what he had to say. I worked at the ranger station in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey back in 2012. Of course, my friends would always remind me of the lore that went with the area, especially surrounding the Jersey Devil. I wasn't one for superstition, so I really didn't pay any mind, even back in school as a kid. Sure, the stories were scary, but to me there was no proof, so I couldn't believe in it. I was working the night shift one evening, and I had just settled in to watch a movie on my computer. I got some work done and decided it was time for my usual break and dinner, if you could call it that, at 9 p.m. We usually didn't have a ton of people here in the spring. Everyone wanted to come in the fall when it was all spooky, so I wasn't really watching out for much that night. I ate and watched a film in peace and quiet, but around 11.30 everything changed. I heard a loud noise come from outside, followed by what would be wings flapping. It was like something crashing into a tree or one of the dumpsters outside, and then decided to try to fly away right after it. I went outside to have a look. I regretted opening the front door. When I saw him from afar, my first thought was that it had to be some sort of large bird and he was thrashing around, obviously hurting from whatever he crashed into. He seemed disheveled, fur and feathers both on his body. I inched closer and that's when it took notice of me. It stopped thrashing and stood on its short hind legs. Its red eyes stared through me as its serpent-like tongue came out to lick its lips. It opened its wingspan as if it were threatening me. I couldn't move. I didn't want to run and make it angry, but I had no idea what this thing was. It started walking towards me, its wingspan longer than its body. That's when I ran in and slammed the door behind me. The creature seemed angered by this, moving its head back and forth as if it was looking for another way in. It was like a hideous bat with this scrunched up snout, but it felt like I was looking at a small dragon. At that point, I ran back to my desk and I grabbed my rifle where I had it locked up. When he saw the rifle in the window, he backed off a little bit, but still flapped his wings like he was trying to get me more afraid. I don't know if he thought that that would make me open the door, but I didn't move. 
Out of frustration, the creature fell right to the window, but you could tell that it hurt itself again as it stumbled back. It stared at me one last time and then took off flying towards the sky. On the window, there were marks from the saliva and mud on its face. I spent the rest of my shift sitting there staring out the window until I fell asleep. When I woke up, my partner had come in for his shift at about 7 in the morning and was asking me what was on the window. I tried to explain to him that I saw this creature, but he laughed it off, saying that everyone thinks that they see that creature around the Pine Barrens. The only people who believed me were my friends. After that encounter, I never doubted them again. This next account comes from Randy, who had two close calls within 15 minutes of each other. Here's what he had to say. I was out on patrol and it was a very clear night at Harriman State Park in Bear Mountain. It was right before the pandemic, but this place was already a ghost town because of the season. The park was huge, so I had to take a section every night. There were several of us patrolling with our radios. It had snowed that day, so the roads were covered with ice and snow. So I was driving slowly because of this, not really exceeding 20 miles per hour. My radio had been acting up all evening, so I really wasn't able to communicate with dispatch. It was very spotty. I passed one of the trails as I drove, and I noticed movement from one of the bushes alongside the road. I prepared for a deer running out by stopping my car and waiting, and then my radio came back to life. Dispatch told me that they were getting reports from people who said that they saw something walking on two legs near another trailhead, which was about three miles away from where I was patrolling. Now, being alone in the woods at night always gives me a slight adrenaline rush. But then after hearing this report, it made me a little nervous and I began to wonder what would be crossing in front of me. And why was it taking its time? Then suddenly, this bear comes out in front of me, and it looked angry. I noticed in my headlight that it had this giant scratch mark on its back. This was a pretty big black bear. So I was wondering what would leave that type of scratch mark on it. I sat in the car for a few minutes and just watched this bear as it slowly crossed the road. I got ready to put the car in drive when another movement came from the same spot that the bear jumped out from. And that's when my radio began making these odd noises. Out of the bush and into the road came this large, dark figure. It was taller than the bear had been. This definitely wasn't a bear because this thing walked on two feet, and its shoulders were so much wider than any bear that I've ever seen. This creature got to the road and stood there looking in my direction. It was right in my headlights, and I was able to make out what it looked like. It had a large black body, and it had no hair on its face but it did have some around its neck and down the middle of its chest. I could make out two very angry yellow eyes in this snout almost dog-like, but still scrunched up like a pig. Its teeth were jagged and didn't seem to fit in its mouth. It seemed to have these very long arms which hung past its knees. This creature just stood there looking at me. I didn't know what it wanted, but it didn't look happy. It stood there staring at me, and I just had this reaction of honking my horn. And then it turned and got on all fours and started taking off towards the bear. I had my windows down so I could hear it chasing after the bear. And then I heard this loud yelp. I put my car in drive and I started heading back to the ranger station. My radio came alive again after about a mile, and dispatch asked me if I was all right. I never answered the last few calls because the radio was acting up. I told them exactly what I saw, and there was another ranger who spotted something similar. We shut down a few trails for about a week and a half and continued to investigate, but we never found anything in that investigation, so we had to reopen the trails. This was by far the strangest thing that's ever happened to me on the job. This account comes from John, who worked at the Allegheny National Forest, and he discovered something very unexpected while out on patrol. Here's how John describes it. I was out on patrol my first year working in the Allegheny National Forest. I was driving along the road in the middle of nowhere when something just caught my eye. It looked like a dead deer laying on the side of the road with its back to me. 
But as I got closer, it became more and more clear that it wasn't a deer. It was a human being. I drove up to within 20 feet of the body, and it was laying on its side with its back facing me. The first thing I noticed was there was flies everywhere. Must have been a thousand of them, just crawling all over this guy's hair, his eyes, nose, and mouth. It was pretty nasty. He had on this blue jean jacket with jeans, and one leg was cut off above his knee. He had tennis shoes on with these white socks pulled up just below his knees. His skin color was this grayish blue, like he had been dead for quite some time. As I looked at this man, all I could see was this small hole in the shoulder area of his jacket, like something poked through. It looked like a bullet hole. It was about an inch and a half wide, and it looked like it torn through his jacket that he was wearing. I wondered if maybe someone shot him and left him there thinking he was dead, only to die later from his wounds. I called in the dispatch, reporting what little information I could gather at this point, including my location coordinates. It wasn't long before the police showed up with an ambulance. I was asked to step back so they could do their jobs, and I did. The ambulance crew came over with a stretcher and loaded the body up on it, and the police officer told me that he had been dead for at least a week or two. The police officer asked me several questions, and I told him basically what just had happened is I stumbled upon him when I was driving on patrol, and as I got closer to the body, I just saw that he had a hole um, piercing his jacket on his right shoulder. He looked all around the area where the body was laying, but he didn't find anything out of place, so they put yellow crime scene tape around everything and started their investigation, and I drove back to the ranger station. I later found out that the man was indeed shot, but they never had a suspect. As far as I know, the case is still open. That was definitely one of the crazier things that I've encountered while working for the National Park Service. This last account comes from Manny, who found something living in Zion National Park that wasn't supposed to be there. Here's what he had to say. I worked at Zion National Park in Utah. One warm afternoon, I was patrolling a rather desolate area of the park. I didn't normally go this way because people stayed more towards the open airfields and the higher elevations. This was a low area in the park called Coal Pits Wash and the brush and the trees were not suitable for the everyday park goer. As I came down the path above the wash, I noticed something that I've never seen before. There was a small makeshift wooden shed down below. I was stunned at first when I first saw it. I thought it was something that the parks department had just thrown up there to clean out the area. That was until I noticed some movement inside. I radioed in to the station and was told there should be no shed out there. So I decided to move closer and investigate. Someone may have been trying to live in the park illegally, but I don't think anybody could live in this little shed. I started making my way towards this shed. My radio crackled again. The ranger station was telling me to approach with caution. As I got closer to this shed, someone in there started banging on the walls and it yelled out this very loud, like angry sound. I drew my weapon and I approached the door of the shed. The door had a small hole in it and I peered through it to see if I could make out what was inside. Maybe it wasn't a human at all, maybe it was just an animal trapped. As I put my eye to the hole, I saw shadows moving and then this wide black eyeball with the white of it all bloodshot popped right up staring right back at me. The door swung open and this older gentleman stepped out. He was dressed like a hobo clown but he had no makeup on. His eyes wouldn't blink as I stared back at him. There were rings around his eyes and his face was filthy. He grinned this crooked grin with missing teeth, but the teeth that he did have were all like sharp. He started laughing really loudly and stepped towards me. I stepped back and I pointed my weapon at him. I told him to get on the ground, but he wouldn't listen. So I radioed in for backup. Within about 10 minutes, a few other rangers showed up and it took three of us to apprehend this man. I don't know how long this guy was living in the park or what he was doing out there. I never really followed up after he got out of jail, but that was definitely the craziest thing I've ever experienced working there. This first account was sent in by Liam who had a very odd encounter at Gifford Pinchot National Forest. Here's what he had to say. I was a ranger at Gifford Pinchot National Forest in Washington. 
It was a pretty busy tourist area, being by the Pacific Crest Trail. One night in April of 2015, I was driving along the edge of a very wooded area, and as I drove, I saw this light in the distance. It was too bright to be a campfire, and it didn't flicker like one either. I pulled up closer and saw that it was indeed some kind of lamp or flashlight, but there were no people around it. I parked my car on the side of the road and decided to go check out what this thing was. I walked down towards where I saw the light shine from, and as I got closer I started hearing some strange noises coming from that area of the woods. They sounded like somebody grunting while fighting with someone else, but there was only one voice struggling. The sounds became louder as I approached until finally about 10 feet away a deer came running out of the brush straight past me. I thought the deer was being chased by something far bigger than itself, but it still didn't explain the light, so I continued walking into the woods. When I got to the area where the light had been, on the ground was this old lantern. It was really old. As I examined it, something ahead of me was coming towards me. I looked up to see this old woman with these crazy eyes in nothing but a nightgown. She had her hands up and then came down with her fingers to grab my shoulders. Her face was sunken in and she had no eyelids. Her mouth was huge and she was just screaming in my face, help me, as she shook me back and forth. Was she lost, a vagrant, an escaped mental patient? I had no idea how she was even surviving out here. I tried to calm her down and asked her what was wrong and she kept screaming, help me, over and over again as she shook me harder. I finally got a hold of the lantern and it fell at her feet. The glass shattered and spilled out oil which caught on fire from the flame of the lantern itself. The woman screamed even louder as she turned around and ran away and into the woods. I followed her but I lost sight of her among all the trees in the brush but I had to turn around to put out the fire from the lantern and when I turned back around she was just completely gone. After waiting there for another 20 minutes, I headed back to the station and told everyone what had happened. The next day, we had a small search and rescue effort for this lady, but she was never seen or heard of again. This next account was sent in by Dalton, who saw something odd in the sky while working in the early hours of the morning. Here's what he recalls. This happened when I was working at Mills Nori State Park in Statsburg, New York. I was on patrol in the early morning hours of June 14th in 2010. The sky was just beginning to show a hint of blue. This happened when I was near the golf course close to the park. It was about 5 a.m. when I reached this clearing near the golf course. I was doing my rounds and no one was out in the field, and that's where I saw this light in the distance from the trees beyond the golf course. It was blinking a few times like an SOS. I didn't know if somebody was lost and trying to get my attention, so I decided to go take a look. I pulled up to the edge of the course and I got out. Before taking off, I radioed in that I was going to be investigating some strange lights, and then I threw the radio back onto the driver's seat. I had to walk across this field to get to the light. I could see that there was this figure standing beside the light, but I couldn't make out much. I took out my flashlight and called out to the person, but there was no answer. Then this super bright light was shining and it didn't go off. It was so blinding that I had to drop my flashlight to shield my eyes so I could look in the direction of the light. I thought to myself, what in the hell is going on? This was like a stadium light. It was so bright. Then I felt this wind whipping around me and as my eyes started to focus in the area where the light was coming from, I could see that figure in the field was gone. Then without warning, the light began to move up through the trees slowly, and then it came above the trees and I could see that it was about the size of my patrol car, maybe a little larger, but it had an oval shape to it. It was gray and shiny in the light. It almost appeared like a mirror. I thought to myself, holy hell, this is an alien ship. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Then it shot up into the air at a 45 degree angle at an amazing speed. I stood there for a moment trying to figure out what in the heck is happening. I didn't understand what I had seen exactly. 
There was really only one explanation. There's no way something like that was just hanging out in upstate New York. I got back to my car and went to the station. The morning shift was there and I told them what I saw, but I'm not really sure what they thought. They really didn't say much. Heck, I don't even know what I saw that morning. Thanks for telling my story. Have you ever seen something so creepy that you had no idea what it was? Well, that is what happened to Phil while working at the Shenandoah National Park. Here's what he had to say. I was on patrol in the Loft Mountain region of the Shenandoah National Park. This was back in 2011. My station wasn't too far off. There were a ton of overlooks in the park. There were a ton of overlooks along the road that I would stop at all night to make sure there were no kids partying there. We had a few incidents the summer before. I had stopped at an overlook, got out, and I was standing there beside my patrol car, facing the woods below. It was dusk in the early summer, about 8 or 8.30 p.m. That's when I started to hear something in the woods below me. There was snapping of large branches and leaves falling off the trees and crunching to the ground. I was only about 20 or maybe 30 feet away from the bottom of this ledge, so whatever it was had to be pretty large by the sounds of it. By the sounds of it, it could be a bear, I thought. I stood there listening to it moving closer, trying to figure out what exactly it could be. I peered over the railing of the overlook, trying to get a better idea of what it was. And then out from the darkness, staring back at me, were these two orange eyes. Just poking out above the brush were two antlers, thick and crooked. Now, I've seen plenty of white-tailed deer in my day, and I can tell you, this wasn't a deer. The antlers threw me off. This thing let out this horrible sound that sounded like a howl and a human scream combined into one. The sound was the most horrific thing I've ever heard to this day because whatever it was, it sounded like it was in pain. It was like screaming for help. I stood there frozen for a minute, kind of unable to move. Then this creature let out another scream then ducked back into the brush. I turned around and ran as fast as I could back to my car. Once inside, I locked all the doors and hightailed it out of there. Now, I can't tell you what that thing was that I saw, but it didn't seem like it was from this world. This next account is a close encounter of something very large in the forest of Yellowstone National Park, and it wasn't a grizzly bear. Here's what Dennis had to say about his time working as a ranger. I worked as a backcountry ranger in Yellowstone National Park, and this was in August of 2014. I was on a trail with another ranger to clear the trail after a heavy rainfall. We were working on a steep hillside with lots of deadfall and loose rocks. We were about a half mile from the trailhead and had been working for several hours when I heard something moving through the woods above us sounded like it was walking on limbs and snapping them as it went. This continued for about 10 minutes until we could no longer hear it. I thought nothing of it at first, but after another 20 minutes or so, my co-worker said he thought he saw something moving upslope through the trees. I looked, but I couldn't see anything, so we kept working for another 15 or 20 minutes before taking a break to listen more closely and smelled this awful musky odor that kind of reminded me of a wet dog mixed with rotten eggs. We decided to move a little bit and finish clearing the trail downslope from where we heard the breathing. Once there, I noticed whatever it was moved further away from us. However, it was still audible though. After a few minutes, I noticed some movement in front of us along the tree line about 30 or 40 yards away where there's a small opening in the trees. There's a small stream that runs through there, too. I watched as what appeared to be a very large man walking slowly through the opening. It was broad-shouldered and had this long, dark hair all over its body. It was hunched over slightly and had its arms close to its body. I thought it looked like a guy in a bear suit at first, but quickly realized that no man could possibly be that big or move so smoothly while he's hunched over. As it walked through the opening, it turned towards us just for a second, and that's when I noticed its eyes were this yellowish-brown and very small compared to the rest of its head. 
I've spent countless hours in the backcountry myself, as well with others, and have never seen anything remotely resembling this creature. After watching what I can only describe as some sort of Sasquatch walk calmly through an opening less than 50 yards away from me, my co-worker and I both ran down the trail towards our truck, which is about a half mile away. We didn't say much to each other until we got back to the ranger station, where several other rangers were working. They all asked us if we heard any strange noises today, since there had been reports from hikers of loud whooping sounds coming from the areas where we were. We told them what had happened, but decided not to file an official report, because we feared ridicule from fellow employees, many of whom are avid hunters or disbelief from park management who would rather not deal with such things within their borders. Grand Canyon National Park, located in Arizona, draws 5.9 million visitors a year. It's the second most popular national park in the United States, and is also the national park with the second highest number of search and rescue missions. Arizona itself has a startling number of missing persons with 10 open cases per 100,000 people. The Grand Canyon is a staple among road trip itineraries and is one of the most well-known natural features in the United States. The park's 1,200,000 acres encompasses as a section of the Colorado River as well as the ancestral homeland of 11 native tribes. Trails throughout the Grand Canyon fall under a few different designations, including corridor trails, threshold trails, rim, and primitive trails. Each trail designation has its own difficulty level. Both expert hikers and beginners can find an appropriate trail in the park. However, even those who hike regularly can stumble and lose their footing. On average, there are 12 deaths per year in the Grand Canyon. Many are from falls or dangerous conditions such as overheating. Some people drown in the river that cuts through the canyon. But even more concerning are the number of disappearances in the Grand Canyon. Countless people have turned a corner only to never be seen again. And nothing is ever found to hint at what might have happened to them. No personal belongings, no blood, no footsteps. Let's take a closer look at some of the most interesting missing person cases in America's second most popular national park. Mary Begay worked at the Bright Angel Lodge, located on the canyon's edge near the Grand Canyon Village. It's a beautiful lodge with exposed timber, natural rock, and native-inspired art. On August 1, 1957, Mary and her three friends, also employed at the park, left the employee housing area and went to the Grand Canyon Inn, which is no longer running. At the inn, they had a few drinks. Mary wore a white sweater and pedal pusher pants. She had black hair and brown eyes. She was later seen getting into the car with two unidentified men. There has been no sign of her since. Begay didn't return to work as scheduled and was therefore fired by park authorities. Her belongings were boxed up. Only when her family came to visit was it reported as a missing case. Another unfortunate example of Native American disappearances getting overlooked and mishandled. Mary's family reported her missing to the Navajo Nation authorities. And a year later, the county sheriff's office was made aware. At just 20 years old, disappearing most likely wasn't the plan for Mary Begay. She kept in contact with her family right up until August 1st, when they stopped hearing from her completely, dispelling theories that she may have simply run away. Rumors would later surface that Begay moved to Los Angeles or Oregon, but no proof was ever brought forward, and the authorities thought it was highly unlikely that she would simply leave her life and family behind. Initially, Bones found just outside of the Grand Canyon on October 31, 1958, were thought to be Begay's, but further testing showed that there was not a match. Interestingly, the bones were never matched to anyone, leading to just another cold case in the Grand Canyon area. Justin Lee Richardson was only 13 years old when he went missing while hiking with friends. 
Justin was described as a very popular teen, possibly dabbling in drugs and alcohol for a year before his disappearance. He entered the woods near the Grand Canyon with three male friends in the area of the Kaibab National Forest on June 29, 2001. It's a beautiful landscape of pines, elk, meadows, and bison. Justin hiked with three friends, all of whom ranged in age from 18 to 21. Despite his young age, there is speculation by authorities that Justin might have been partying with the group under the influence of drugs. The following events are definitely strange and support the idea that Justin and his companions may have not been quite in their right minds. Of the group, two friends got separated. Justin and another friend went to Tucson, Arizona and asked for help locating the missing pair. Unknown to Justin, they were found by the Grand Canyon Railway employees just south of Tucson. Justin and another friend returned to the Kaibab National Forest area, just a few miles south of the Grand Canyon. The friend who accompanied him, reportedly under the influence of methamphetamines, fell asleep at 9 a.m. and didn't wake up until 5 p.m. He woke to find Justin gone, but didn't report him missing. Instead, he just hitched a ride back to Tucson. On July 2nd, Justin's father reported him missing to authorities. A search of the area began, but never turned up any sign of the boy. The fact that Justin was very familiar with this area, as he had visited it four times before his disappearance, supports the suspicion that he may have been under the influence of something or run into bad luck. What is the likelihood that he got lost in familiar surroundings? Justin had run away from home before. His parents were divorced and his girlfriend lived out of state. Justin lived with his father in Tucson. He was described as being able to come and go as he pleased. But at the time, and as the years have gone by, authorities have decided that it's more likely that there was foul play involved with his disappearance. If Justin was just lost, he could have followed any number of helicopters, which frequent the skies in this area, back toward the town. In 2014, as authorities continued to investigate Justin's disappearance, evidence came forward supporting the fact that Justin returned to the Mokai Lodge, near to where the friends and family initially entered the forest, after he was last seen. They never identified what exactly the evidence is. Whether Justin tried to hitchhike or got into a car with the wrong person or came across someone evil out in those woods, the outcome on that day in late June remains unknown. Adam Jones was last seen by his family in Gulf Breeze, Florida. So how is it that we know that the Grand Canyon is tied into his disappearance? 33 at the time, Jones left home around noon on March 31st of 2011 and drove his light blue Oldsmobile Delta 88. His plan was to travel west. Oddly, Jones only brought a laptop with him, no cell phone, personal belongings, or camping gear. Over a month later, on May 5, 2011, a park ranger with the Grand Canyon National Park found the abandoned Oldsmobile at the visitor center in the South Rim area. The visitor center is comprised of several parking areas leading to the center itself, the shuttle stop, a few stores and cafes in a market plaza. Hikers can also access a few trails from this area. As far as the rim itself, visitors can walk right up to several outlooks to take in the amazing views. The ranger who found Jones' car notified his family, who then reported him missing. Inside the vehicle was an itinerary that laid out a route of travel, including stops in Denver and various California cities. But Adam would never make it that far. Several people die of falls at the Grand Canyon each year. Could Adam Jones be one of those people? Floyd Roberts III disappeared on June 17, 2016 and was reporting missing the next day by Floyd's friend, Ned Bryant. Roberts and Bryant had planned a multi-day hike in a remote portion of the park, with Ned's daughter accompanying them, Madeline Bryant. The goal was to hike the western area of the Grand Canyon on the Shivwitz Plateau, 
The hike would take nine days and the group would leave the Grand Canyon via Separation Canyon. The Shivwitz Plateau is comprised of the Hualupai Indian Reservation along the course of the Colorado River, which encircles the plateau. A section of the Shivwitz is at a low enough elevation with small hills and canyons to touch down onto the riverside. The Separation Canyon Trail has many opportunities for exploration, with Separation Peak being a favorite that offers views to the north and the south. Considered a moderately strenuous hike, Separation Canyon is noted by visitors to be hard to navigate and barely marked. Roberts was 52 when he went missing, and he was an experienced hiker. He hiked the canyon before. That day in June, he wore a red long sleeve shirt, denim jeans, and Nike-free sneakers. He carried with him a large blue backpack, day pack, and sunglasses. Although Roberts was last seen near Kelly Tank heading towards Trail Canyon, he may have gone the route of Mile Canyon. The plan was for Roberts to split from Ned and Madeline when they reached the hill. They would meet up on the other side. With Roberts' experience, there was little doubt that he wouldn't make it to the other side. But when Roberts didn't show, the Bryants backtracked to look for him. They didn't find any sign of him at all. They decided to camp for the night. Roberts still didn't return the next day. So Ned and Madeline hiked to an area with cell reception and called in a missing persons alert. The six-day search effort took place during an excessive heat warning in the area. If Roberts had stumbled and was waiting injured somewhere, it may be possible that help would have not arrived in time for him. But the only thing that may have been a sign of Floyd Roberts passing through the area was a set of footprints, unable to be proven as his. No body or belongings was ever located, and as far as we know today, Floyd Roberts III never left that canyon. There's not a lot of information about Jang Hyun, who was 45 at the time of his disappearance. Authorities noted that he was thought to be in the Grand Canyon area on September 17, 2017. His vehicle was seen near the New Hans Trailhead and later found abandoned at Moran Point. But no one knows what he was wearing or if he was with anyone. Moran Point is one of the most visited overlooks in the park, and it's hard to believe that no one got a good look at Jang, or noticed him if he was in the area. The point offers breathtaking views of the Red Canyon in the Coronado Butte. There's no information on who exactly authorities spoke to, and no articles where Jang's family or friends were interviewed, but it's noted that he had no known plans to be in the area. If that's true, why did Jang take a trip to the canyon? Just to take in the views like everyone else? Or did he have an unfortunate misstep near the overlook point? In Navajo, Anusazi means both the ancient ones and ancient enemies. This group of hunter and gatherers were thriving in the Grand Canyon about 2,000 years ago, and their disappearance is without a doubt one of the most confusing and oldest cases. The Smithsonian dates the Anusazi culture back to as early as 1500 BC. They moved their settlements into caves along the cliffs around 1250 BC and were known as skilled basket weavers and potters. From the way this population took charge of their surroundings and comfortably settled in 600 feet above the canyon floor, it's obvious that the Grand Canyon's harsh environment didn't cause them too much worry. At the end of the 13th century, the Anusazi fled the area, and no one was quite sure why. Their settlements were abandoned, apparently abruptly as some areas were still under construction or very newly built. Experts are unsure why the Anusazi left their homeland in Arizona. Theories include climate change, topsoil erosion, hostility from new arrivals, a prolonged drought, and the encroachment of the Mesoamerican cultures. There are many possibilities, but no clear answer. Some archaeologists and anthropologists believe that the Anusazi were so diverse they simply split up and became many different tribes, but the decision to completely abandon such a beautiful, solid dwelling place is an odd one. 
if that's what really happened. The most recent case of a missing person in the Grand Canyon National Park is that of Charles Lyon, a 49-year-old who was last seen on June 10th in the Tucson Hotel. His car was found the next day near La Pan Point, a cliff area of the park that offers stunning views of slopes and valleys. The fact that it was parked along the rim and not at the point itself has led authorities to refer to the vehicle as abandoned. Lyon was 6'3", weighed 177 pounds, and looked to be in decent shape. Visiting from Texas, Lyon is thought to have been unaccompanied. On June 11th, Park Services began searching with both ground teams and helicopters in the area. Three months later, in September 2021, the Park Service stated that they were scaling back the search, though it would be in a limited and continuous mode. For the National Park Service, this means focusing less on searching the ground and more on public outreach. Search efforts of the area will take place during regular backcountry patrols and regularly scheduled helicopter flights. These are just some of the missing person cases that are still active in Grand Canyon National Park. Most searches, like the one for Floyd Roberts III, are noted by the Park Service to be in a limited and continuous mode. But what that appears to mean is that authorities are no longer actively looking, just hoping to stumble across remains or belongings, as they have in the past. However, there have been several surprising instances of missing persons in the area being found alive and well. Did any of the people on the list do a total 180 and decide to start a new life, disappearing into the crowds on a busy tourist day? Or is it more likely that they got a little too close to the famous rim of the canyon and fell to an area with no visibility and little travel? Unfortunately, it's been pointed out over the years that the Grand Canyon isn't an unusual spot for those who want to end their lives to go. In fact, Drake Kramer, who went missing on January 31st of 2015, is thought to be one of them. Although no trace has ever been found of Kramer, he was believed to be suicidal at the time. No matter the cause, it's always a little surprising when someone can just vanish into thin air. After all, it could be you or a close friend or a relative who goes out of sight for only a moment, never to be seen again. But it's important to remember that in an area as massive as the Grand Canyon, there are so many ways to disappear. And in this harsh but beautiful environment, there are so many ways to die. Hey Donovan, I've been checking out your channel and I like your content. I was never one for the supernatural until my first year on the search and rescue team at a well-known national park. I have some stories that will bend your mind because they bent mine. Everything from strange disappearances to staircases in the woods and just flat out weird experiences altogether. So this happened when I was on the first year on the job. I worked on the search and rescue team, like I said, and we were looking for an 11 year old girl who had been reported missing by her parents. At the time, this was only my third search and rescue effort. And anytime you hear of a child going missing, it's pretty sad. I've been doing this for eight years now and you never become numb to the fact that it's someone's kid. The parents are always devastated to say the least. Without giving too much away with where I work because I want to remain anonymous for obvious reasons. I want to keep my job and the higher ups really don't like us talking to the media or sharing any exact details about any case. So the family was camping in a remote area of the park. It was the mother, father, teenage daughter and 11 year old daughter. They had been at the park for several days and were avid campers and hikers. A real outdoorsy family. In the early morning, the younger daughter was the first to rise and went for a walk while the others were sleeping. She was sleeping in the tent with her sister and the parents were in another tent right beside them. She told her sister she was going to hang outside until everyone woke up. The other sister really didn't think anything of it at the time. That was the last time that her sister ever spoke to her. When the others got up, they thought she might have been out for a walk, but then they quickly realized that she was nowhere to be found. That's when we got the call from the mother and we sent the search and rescue team out there to their location. We had canines with us too. 
We had someone on the team that specialized in missing children. We do find a lot of the children. A lot of them are alive. However, we do find some dead. And there's even a smaller amount that go missing or turn up months or even years later, leaving us all shaking our heads on exactly how it happened. We started at their campsite and made sure the dogs got her scent. And then they started tracking her. We followed them for about a mile when the dogs started going crazy. They led us to the base of this tree and they were barking up the tree. We look up and then there in the branches, 35 feet into the air, is this girl's orange jacket that she was wearing. I thought to myself, how in the hell did it get up there? We were all puzzled. We were there for a good while and sent someone up the tree to retrieve her coat and let the dogs get the scent of the coat, but the trail stopped there. It just went cold. The search and effort lasted for a few more weeks until it was downgraded to a limited and continuous mode, which basically means we are no longer actively searching, but we're always on the lookout for every case like this. To this day, that is all we ever found. Now here's where shit gets really crazy. A few months after this search and rescue mission, I'm around the same general area where we were searching. We were at least a few miles deep into the forest from the nearest trail or road. It's not the remotest part of the park, but it's pretty remote. You get the picture. I was doing some training exercises with a buddy of mine, and we come across this staircase in the middle of the forest. I shit you not. It was like it was taken out of somebody's house and dropped right into the middle of the forest. The steps had this runner of a carpet over this lightly stained oak wood and a matching banister and all white spindles. I've heard from other rangers that if you come across a staircase, don't touch it, don't go near it, and definitely do not walk up it. The vet rangers kind of act weird if you even bring it up. Previous to this, I tried to pry and get more information from them because I just found it so fascinating. But all I ever get told is to stay away and just let it be. Well, to hell with all that. I went over and inspected the staircase. And it was clean. I thought to myself, how can this staircase be clean in the middle of the forest? I I don't get it. No bugs. No dirt on it. No bird poop. Nothing. My buddy and fellow ranger told me we should probably just let it be and don't disturb it. And I told him, come on, man, it's a staircase. And someone just put it here to to freak people out. That's it. We both laughed and I told him, well, let's just walk up a few steps. That's it. We started walking up the staircase when all of a sudden my buddy stops dead in his tracks and says, I don't think this is a good idea. I said, what are you talking about? He then looks at me and says, I've done some research on these things. They can be dangerous if you go too far or touch something you're not supposed to. I was like, really? You gotta be kidding me. So I asked him, what do they do? He said, I don't know for sure, but I heard stories of people going missing after coming across one of these staircases. That's when I started getting a little freaked out because that's when he reminded me that this is when that girl went missing a few months back. I never really put it together until that point. Now, there's not much that freaks me out, but I have to say that freaked me out quite a bit. We got three steps up on that staircase, and that was enough for me. I don't know if the staircase had anything to do with that missing girl, but you never know. Maybe she went all the way up and went off into another dimension. I have no idea. I've seen several of these staircases since over my years on the SAR team. However, I stay away now when I tell the same thing to younger rangers like the vets told me when I first started. Just stay away from them and don't touch them. Now here's a story from another ranger that pretty much blew my mind. I heard this story about a year or two after I was on the team from another ranger who is now retired, but he was on a search and rescue mission for a little boy, I believe he was four or five years old. The parents had five or six kids, all pretty young, and were having a picnic in the area of the park. One of the kids wandered off for a brief second and the dad went chasing after him, and he's nowhere to be found. 
Obviously, the dad and mom are in full panic mode because they just lost their five-year-old. The SAR team heads out right away and starts looking for this little boy. The dogs got his scent and then just nothing. The trail leads to absolutely nowhere. They had the scent where the boy had disappeared to. Then like 50 feet after that, it just goes cold. The search continued for the rest of that day and into the next day. They searched a several mile radius from when he went missing and no clues or signs of the boy. Around 5 p.m. the second day, there is a call into the ranger station where someone reported they found a young child in the woods by himself. Matches the description of the missing boy. Brown hair, red jacket, blue jeans, white shoes. Everything matches. They headed out to see if this was the boy, and sure enough, it's him. Get this. He's 20 miles away from where he went missing. Now, how in the hell does this little boy travel 20 miles in less than 24 hours and not have a single scratch on him? They interviewed the boy, and all he would talk about is the fuzzy man. I'll send in some more stories when I have time, but... These are by far the most mind-bending stories that I have. Now hopefully we hear more from Ranger X, but until we do, here's a few more creepy and odd encounters that people have had in national and state parks. I was with friends hiking in Rocky Mountain State Park. We were fresh out of high school in 2005, and decided to take a big week-long trip before college started. We spent the first few days swimming and fishing, doing normal stuff. We had an older friend that brought some beers and we sat around a campfire talking about our futures. By day three, I was feeling very relaxed. However, that day my friends started to pack up their equipment to migrate deeper into the woods. That night, while we were out, we decided to continue hiking until we found the first flat space or clearing we could rest at and pitch our tents. Personally, I was not too happy that we left the safer campsite altogether. I was hoping that we would be in one place and just hike from there, but my friend who was leading us was more of a daredevil. The moon was out, but the light was blotted out by the trees. We went out for a night hike with our flashlights and we came across a shallow cave that appeared to be empty. It was large enough for all seven of us to settle into, and there were no signs of animals staying there. So my friend decided that this would be the place that we set up our tents. As we were trying to get our tents up by the lantern light, I heard some strange noise coming from the back of the cave. It sounded human, but not completely human. It almost sounded like a mix between a groan and a growl. The pitch was also off, as if it were an animal trying to sound like a person. At this point, all of us got scared and wanted to leave immediately. My friend, who is very experienced with the outdoors, kept trying to explain it away as a bat or some small creature that was hiding. I wanted out of the cave, but he got us to stay, saying that it was safer here than hiking any longer. We would have to wait until morning to find our way back to our original site. Everyone tucked themselves into their tents, but I couldn't go inside mine. I was too busy looking towards the dark back corners of the cave. I walked over slowly with my lantern raised, and that's when I noticed some writings on the wall of the cave. They were in English, but they were written in blood or something similar to it. It was hard to tell because it had been so long since they were written. I took pictures of them with my phone, because I wanted to show that we probably weren't as safe as we thought. There could have been an animal from a sacrifice dying in the back of the cave. People may return to do some weird stuff. The writing said things like, he's coming, and get out, and help me. Some parts of the wall looked like they had been hit repeatedly by something heavy. There were also scratch marks. On my way to my friend's tent to show him that we weren't safe, I started hearing voices whispering around me, almost as if there were people standing beside me. I stopped in my tracks and turned to look. There, in the corner where the sound had come from, was a pale figure, 
like a person in a sheet, appearing more and more solid as I watched. And then the shape went from his sheet to a figure of a small child. I realized I was looking at a small glowing boy who couldn't have been older than seven. I froze. The boy looked at me and was silent at first. Then he opened his mouth like he was going to scream, but nothing came out. He jumped at me and I jumped back to avoid him going through me. As he landed on the ground, he began getting sucked through it and screamed, this time audibly with the sound that we had heard before. Then he disappeared into the soil. My friends all poked out of their tents as I was running by shouting. Needless to say, no one believed what I saw, but everyone immediately began packing and we sat there awake until dawn. Just last year, I was out with my dog hiking, as I usually did on my evenings off. I lived right by the Duchess Rail Trail in New York State, and that was an easy track for me and my dog when I wasn't interested in going to the mountains. It always felt safer because in the summer it stayed lighter and there were a lot more people out. I didn't realize on this particular night it was going to rain, so it was just my dog and I making the trek alone. I didn't feel nervous at first because we were able to see cars here and there, but as we got away from the Hudson River view and deeper on the trail, I was feeling a little unsettled, like something was going to jump out at us. Somewhere along the way, my dog began getting really uneasy. He started to jump around like he smelled something. I had never known my dog to be like that outside. He was very well trained, but that day he suddenly became unstable. My nerves were on edge at that point. The rain began and I was itching for the closest exit off the trail. I would have to figure out how to get home, but I was convinced something was wrong. We came around a bend where the trail looked like it had a staircase down to the main road. I got excited, but then my dog took off, pulling the leash from my hand and ran past the stairs into some brush along the side of the pavement. That's when I saw it. Laying there in the middle of the trail, facing away from me, so all I could see was its backside, was a creature that I had never seen before. I could only think it had to be a dog or a coyote at first before it showed its true size. When my dog got to it, the creature turned and snapped at him, scaring him back towards me. Then it began to pull itself up to standing. What looked like it should have stopped at all fours kept going until it was at least eight feet in the air on its hind legs. It took one step forward and growled loudly at me through the rain. I noticed in the darkening evening light that its leg looked injured. It had long brown hair and very broad shoulders. My first thought was it looked like a werewolf because of its height, hair, and stature, but it had very little human qualities, and I didn't believe that this thing changed into anything. I thought it was the exact monster it was. Noticing its injury, I felt bolder, so I headed closer to it by a few steps to get a closer look. It limped forward and growled again, almost like it was warning me to back away. I grabbed my dog's leash and we did just that, never taking my eyes off this creature. I noticed as I looked into its eyes, they were red and its face had cuts and matted fur all over it. As I stepped back more, it crouched down on all fours, exposing its long torso and I could see it had a bitten up rat tail hanging from its back. It let out one more growl still not taking its eyes off me and began limping in the opposite direction. I stayed there soaked and standing still until it was completely out of sight and then ran down those steps to the street to the nearest gas station. When I walked in, the attendant asked if I was okay. I didn't want to tell him what I saw, so I just asked him if I could stay in the station until I called a cab. As I waited, we heard another howl. I jumped and the attendant laughed. He asked me if I thought I saw it too. I pretended I didn't know what he was talking about, but apparently there had been other people 
who said they saw this creature on the trail. The attendant just smiled and assured me that it would find its way back to the mountains again. I never walked that trail or went to that gas station again. I was hiking on the Pacific Crest Trail back in 2010. I wanted to do the whole thing, so I started in Canada, and now I had made it to the southern part of Oregon. It was a big challenge for me, but I really look forward to reaching the California-Mexico border. It was the most extreme thing that I've ever done as a hiker. I had made it to a clearing beside the pathway and decided it was time to set up camp. By the next day, I would officially be in California. I set up my sleeping bag and started a little fire just to warm up. It was late evening and my lantern was not enough heat for the cold autumn night on the path. I had been walking for several hours non-stop, so I was really looking forward to laying down. The woods around me were eerily quiet. I had my pack placed behind me on the ground near the bushes as I got comfortable in my sleeping bag. The pack seemed to be moving on its own accord. Something was either trying to get my food or someone was trying to rob me. But I hadn't even fallen asleep. And this weird feeling in my gut came over me. And then that's when I saw it. This shadow of a man crouching behind my pack. I shouted hey at the guy thinking I was going to scare him away. But instead he slowly began poking his head above the pack. His skin was pale white and kind of sickly looking. His eyes were bloodshot red with two black irises in the middle. He didn't blink as he came into the lantern light. I could see how giant the black circles under his eyes were, and his hair was all wild and crazy. He had this really crooked grin with a little bit of saliva coming out of his mouth. The lines in his mouth went through his cheeks, and you could see either missing teeth or sharpened teeth scattered inside. He just grunted as he stood up. He didn't have any weapons in his hands, and his arms were hanging at his waist. He had clothes on like he was Charlie Chaplin, but then they were covered in holes and they were just filthy. I didn't know what to do. I was wrapped in my sleeping bag, and without thinking about my strategy, I thrashed out of my sleeping bag and began crawling in the other direction. He didn't appear to have anything that could harm me, but I was pretty sure that I was going to die in that moment. I didn't want to turn around and see him again, but he started following me, and I could hear him laugh as he did. As soon as I got to my feet, I swung around, and right in my face was this guy. His grin was gone, and he looked extremely angry. I wanted to run, but his eyes kept me there for another moment, and then he looked right into my face and yelled, I am death. Don't come back here. I felt him spit as he yelled it, and I could smell the rot in his breath. Then he backed away and vanished without making a sound. Now, completely freaked out, I decided to get away from there as fast as I could. I traveled several more miles that night, and I still hadn't found a suitable place to camp or where I felt comfortable. I was so spooked that I ended up watching the sun begin to rise. I had made it to California. But I don't know what or who I saw back there in Oregon. It was like a boogeyman from your childhood nightmares. I finished doing the entire path, but I never did it again, and I never went hiking in Oregon again. I was hiking with my two friends on a trail in Promised Land State Park. It was about 11.30 a.m., it was a bright, sunny Sunday with blue skies and no wind, the perfect spring day. My friends and I decided that we need to make hiking more of a habit as we got older and spent literally every Sunday there. Nothing strange had ever happened to us before that day. We had hiked about one mile from the trailhead in my estimation and I was beginning to feel sluggish for some reason. I blamed my blood sugar and sat down on a rock. I told my friends to go on ahead. I knew the trail well enough to catch up. I took out a nature bar and started eating it, taking slugs of my water in between. I thought I was also a little dehydrated, but it had only been a mile, so I didn't know why. That's when I noticed a gully off the trail that I had never explored. We had done so much walking, but never really went off the beaten path too often. I thought that while I was stuck there recovering, I could at least take a look. 
There was a fallen tree blocking the path to it, but I picked myself up after I ate and climbed right over it. It was when I stood over the gully itself that I heard something large moving quickly through the woods on the other side of it. My first thought was that it might be a bear as we did have those in the area, but as it came closer, I realized it sounded much larger than that, and my mind began to run wild thinking what else it could be. I quietly hiked closer to the edge and peered over it. Then I looked behind me, hoping to catch a glimpse of my friends coming to find me. I didn't see them, but instead I heard whatever it was jump down into the gully, followed by this growl. I turned and came face to face with something that literally scared me so badly I almost fell into it. It was enormous enough that in that five foot gully it was still almost to my shoulders with me standing over it. It was hairy with this reddish brown fur all over its body and it was walking on two legs like a person. I'd never seen anything like this before in my life. My mind just froze and I don't know how long I stood there staring into its beady ape-like eyes. But my friends called out for me and it got frightened. It let out this yelp, barring some small sharp teeth in its mouth, and leapt back up on the other side of the gully within a single bound. That's when I noticed its extremely large feet as it ran and disappeared into the woods. When my friends came running up to ask me what took so long, I could barely speak because I was shaking so badly. They followed my gaze past the gully but saw nothing. We left immediately after that without any questions from either one of them because they saw how genuinely terrified I was by whatever I saw. After we buckled into the car, I blurted out that I had seen a Bigfoot. They both started laughing at me, telling me how crazy I sounded. The next thing we heard was another set of yelps and growls coming from the same trail that we had just left. That's when my friends started turning pale as the tree seemed to shake to our right. My friend who was driving took off. My friends didn't see what I saw, but they never bothered me about my fear of that trail again. We decided to take our nature walks to a more public park from then on. Hiking was just too intense for me after that encounter. I was hiking with my girlfriend, now wife, in Promised Land State Park in Pennsylvania. We were there camping and hiking before the summer ended and it was the weekend. I wanted to pop the question. It was around dusk and we decided to go on a romantic little hike before we settled down to eat. I was going to propose that night after we ate, so I wanted to set the tone. We decided to stick to the trails along the campgrounds so we were still close to other people and could just take in the views. The trail was almost completely deserted except for one or two other hikers that were returning to their camp. We exchanged some niceties with them, but I didn't want to talk too long because I had engagement stuff on my mind the whole time. She wanted to stop at this small creek that runs through the camping area and relax for a bit. As rushed as I was making myself, I didn't want to upset her or make her feel like I didn't want her to enjoy her time. I wanted her to say yes after all. We were sitting there as the sun was going down when I noticed something moving through the trees in front of us. I thought nothing of it because there were other people around us. Plus, it could have been a bird rustling branches or something. Just as I finished that thought, my girlfriend turned to me and asked me, what was that moving in front of us? It had appeared to get closer and was moving all the bushes around. I couldn't make out what it was at first, just this black mass in the brush moving around. Then a humanoid-like figure began to form as it made its way towards us. Then I saw what it was as it began to step out into the open, and it really wasn't human at all. My girlfriend and I stood up at the same time, but we were cemented to the ground. On the other side of the creek stood this creature almost like a dog that had been experimented on. Its gray skin was covered in cuts, and its dark brown fur was matted to itself with mud and God knows what else. Its eyes were dark and piercing, the white showing like human eyes, 
and filled with this rage. Its snout was ugly and cut up as well, and from it hung these gangly sharp teeth with saliva dripping from them. It stood about seven feet tall. We couldn't move for what seemed like hours, but in reality it was probably only 20 seconds. After allowing us to look at it, the thing took off towards the campsite behind us. Our mouths were open like we wanted to scream and warn the campers in their tents, but no noise came out. Our eyes locked onto this thing as it began running through the campsite, kicking things over and ripping at the trash. Birds were flying off and people were yelling from inside their tents. Then it took off on all fours into the darkness. I finally broke out of my trance when the campers came out to see the damage. The father of the family looked over at us and started shouting, asking us what it was. All I managed to get out was that it was a bear. He shook his head and the kids started crying about the damage. In turn, my girlfriend turned to me with tears streaming down her face. We needed to get out of there as fast as possible. We were cautious all the way back to our campsite, but we never saw any sign of that thing again. No one else seemed to report anything from that weekend. We had ended up just packing up our things and heading home because it was too much for her to stay here. I proposed to her on the couch when we got back, which certainly saved the evening, but... We never forgot what we saw that night, and it became a big part of our relationship. My wife is obsessed with cryptozoology now. I grew up growing to Promised Land State Park. In my teens, I loved going there with friends for swimming or fishing in the summer. It was an ideal place to grow up, and in 2006, at 16, it had not lost its magic for me. One summer day, I had made plans to meet up with some of our friends at our favorite fishing spot. It was fairly secluded, even in the summer. I could see people like ants along the other side of the water, but they were too far away to pay any attention to us. I had gotten there first because I didn't have a summer job. I was excited about taking an hour to myself to lay on the dirt and get some sun. Behind the fishing spot was a dense spot of trees that were very obviously old. I'd never really noticed them before, but they did look a little strange and creepy. I went to lay down and I heard some giggling coming from that direction. I sat right back up and looked all around me. There was no one there. I decided I was hearing things when it happened again. Just as I was closing my eyes, my eyes shot open, only this time the giggling continued. It was not a very human sound. It sounded almost like this snickering of hyenas, but with more pep. I imagined it was what demons sounded like. I sat up and looked around again and saw nothing, but it kept going. I got up and started walking towards these old crooked trees to see if anyone was hiding in them. There wasn't anyone I could see immediately, so I began to turn my back to the spot when suddenly something came into my view amongst those trees. Whatever it was ran really fast from trunk to trunk. Then, before I could gather myself, another thing was moving the same way. The giggling grew louder. I wanted to run, but I couldn't. I was so used to this area that I had to know who was messing with me. I called out for someone to tell me who they were, but I was met with more giggling. Then the movement stopped. About ten feet in through the trees, a child in a very old Civil War era clothing came out from behind a tree. She was smiling as she curtsied to me. I stepped back and she kept smiling. She was maybe eight or nine years old. I wanted to ask her what she was doing there, but instead of talking, a little boy came out from behind another tree. He looked to be about five or six and he too was in some very old clothes and had blonde hair that hung to his knees. He smiled at me, too, as he made his way over to the girl. They both seemed really happy to see me, and they turned to look at each other. I backed up more as they began to move towards me. I asked them again who they were and to say something, but they just kept advancing. Then two more children popped out behind them, another boy and a girl. They looked to be about five and eight, respectively. They too were dressed in clothes that were not quite as raggedy as the other two's. 
I realized that this wasn't normal. It felt like an ambush. I started to turn in order to run away from them when another taller girl was standing right behind me the whole time. We were now face to face. She was now maybe 13 or 14. She had this long black hair and she was very dirty looking. She smiled at me like the others and didn't try to touch me. I saw some more of them along the water and the people across the pond seemed to disappear. I was alone with whatever these things were. I didn't know what they wanted to do with me, so I finally ran, no longer expressing much curiosity. I could hear the echo of giggling as I ran right into my friends. Then the giggling stopped. I can't explain it, but I know whatever those things were, they were paranormal. When my friends questioned what I was doing, I didn't tell them anything. I held my breath until we got back to the fishing spot and no one was there. Even the trees looked less scary, like they had put on some illusion for me. Needless to say, I never showed up early to anything at that park again. This isn't a supernatural encounter. However, it really scared the hell out of me and my girlfriend at the time. We were out hiking at Yosemite National Park when we noticed this man, probably in his late 50s or early 60s. He was following us from behind. We were about two miles from the trailhead when we first noticed him. We really didn't think anything of it, just that he was probably going in the same direction as us. But he started acting weird and like saying things under his breath, which I couldn't really make out, but it, it just didn't seem right. As we're heading back to the parking lot, this man starts saying, Hey, pretty lady, to my girlfriend, who was about 50 yards behind me at the time. It was very odd, but we just decided to ignore him and keep on walking. But this is when he started getting closer to us, and things started getting really weird. He started asking my girlfriend if she wanted to hang out with him in the woods. I immediately became protective over her and told him that we were happily married and not interested in whatever he was offering. Then he replied saying that he wasn't talking to me. I told him that he needed to leave us alone and mind your own business, which only made him more angry at this point. He kept coming towards us and then that's when he pulled out this massive buck knife about 12 inches long. He started waving it around saying that he was going to cut us up if we didn't leave him alone. Which is crazy because he was the one that was bothering us. My girlfriend and I started running back to the car. Thankfully this man wasn't in good shape because we quickly outran him. I called 911 and reported the man. I don't know if the police ever arrested him but we drove off as soon as we got to the car. This happened while I was at Yosemite National Park in California. I was there with my family for a week in August of 2019. We went hiking to Upper Yosemite Falls on August 10th and it was a gorgeous day. It was about 80 degrees and sunny, but the trail was pretty steep so we were all pretty winded by the time we got to the waterfall. We hung out there for a while taking pictures and enjoying the view. While we were at the top, I noticed a smell that reminded me of a wet dog mixed with garbage, but it wasn't super strong. It seemed like it was coming from below us on the trail, but I couldn't tell exactly where it was coming from because of the wind. After hanging out at the upper falls for about an hour, we decided to head back down since everyone needed some water and we were going to get some lunch afterwards. About halfway down, maybe two thirds of the way down, I started getting this really bad feeling like someone or something was watching us from behind. I looked over my shoulder and saw nothing but trees. It was a really dense forest so there were plenty of places for something to hide. We got close to the car and I told my family what I was feeling. We continued on the trail back to the parking lot and I was scanning the forest for any movement. We were about a half a mile away from the parking lot when I saw this figure moving through the trees about 30 or 40 yards ahead of us. It looked like it had long hair or fur hanging from its body and it seemed to be hunched over as it moved through the trees. I thought maybe it was a bear but it didn't seem quite big enough for that. I'm 6'4 and this thing looked a lot bigger than me. I kept watching after a minute or two and whatever it was stopped moving and stood completely still in one spot. 
It blended in with the trees so well that you really couldn't tell where one ended and another began. After standing still for a few seconds, we heard something that sounded like branches breaking off in the distance behind us. I'm convinced that I saw Sasquatch that day. Thank goodness it wasn't a close encounter. This happened when I was camping with my brother-in-law in Wyoming. We had been elk hunting and we were getting ready to head back to our camp. It was about 4 p.m. and the sun was still pretty high in the sky and we were walking down a draw toward our camp. We had just passed a small pond when I noticed some movement in the trees ahead of us. At first, I thought it was my brother-in-law because he walked about 30 yards ahead of me, but then I realized that this thing was much larger than him. I stopped and watched as this large figure moved from tree to tree until it reached a small clearing where I could see it clearly. It stood there for a moment looking towards my brother-in-law who was now out of sight around another hillside. Then it turned its head and looked directly at me with these eyes that seemed to glow yellow. I froze, not sure what to do as this thing stared at me with an expression on its face that seemed almost curious but also angry at the same time. It stood there for maybe five seconds, then suddenly turned and ran away from me through the trees back in the direction where it came from, moving faster than anything I've ever seen before. I started running after my brother-in-law, yelling for him to stop, but he couldn't hear me. When I finally caught up with him, I explained what had happened, and we both headed back towards that area. We didn't find anything unusual except for some broken branches on some trees, but that could be chalked up to an elk or a deer passing earlier that day. We never saw it again the rest of the time there, and we ended up leaving the next day. I've never seen anything like this creature before or since, but it scared me enough that I'll never forget it. It was much taller than a man, maybe seven feet tall or more, and very muscular with this dark brown hair all over its body, except for its face, which seemed to be a little bit lighter in color. It also had this strange gait, as if it was walking on its toes instead of flat-footed. I didn't see any horns, but did notice that its arms were longer than normal, and that it had these long fingers with claws on them, although they didn't look like claws on a bear. The most striking thing about it was its eyes, which seemed to glow yellow when it looked at me. This happened in the summer of 2007 in the Rocky Mountains National Park. I was working on one of the trails in the park when I heard this woman screaming. It was an unusual scream, not like one of fear or pain, more like a high-pitched shriek. I hurried to where it came from and found this young woman standing on a rock ledge about 20 feet above the ground. She was screaming and pointing at something in the ravine below her. I looked over the edge of the cliff and saw what appeared to be this large, ape-like creature walking away down into the ravine. I stood there for a moment trying to figure out what it could have been but couldn't come up with any logical explanation other than some type of black bear. The creature had these very broad shoulders, long dark hair, and walked upright. It seemed much larger than any normal sized bear that I've seen in these mountains. The thought crossed my mind, am I seeing a Sasquatch? The young lady came down off her perch on top of the rock and approached me shaking badly with fear still showing clearly on her face. When she got close enough for me to hear what she was saying, I noticed that she had an Australian accent. So I asked her if she was lost and if she needed help going back to her campground or cabin nearby. She said no, that she wasn't lost, but rather that thing chased her up onto the ledge where we were standing just a moment earlier. What thing, I asked. That big, hairy, man-like animal, she replied. Are you sure it wasn't just a bear, I said. But I knew in my gut what I just saw. I walked her to my vehicle and drove her back to her camp. She was staying with a group of friends who were all from Australia on some kind of tour. She had got separated from her hiking group and wound up almost falling off this cliff. I tried to get more information out of her, but she was still really shaken up and afraid to talk about it any further. I decided not to press the issue because she was just so shook up. 
The craziest thing is that I saw this thing too. This woman was not lying. I know that for a fact. It was a Sasquatch. I dropped her off at camp and I drove down to that ravine where I last saw it. It was pretty dense forest there, so I didn't see any sign of it, but the whole area smelled like hot garbage. I was about a quarter mile into the ravine where I parked my car and I decided to turn around. It took me like 20 minutes to go a quarter mile in this part of the park because of the rugged terrain. I turned around and started heading back to my car. Then after a few minutes of going back, I hear this loud siren type sound followed by these three short throaty grunts. Never heard anything like this before. And we don't have any sirens out here. I knew that this thing was close or could sense me nearby. I continued on towards my car, and when I finally got to my car, I heard that loud siren sound once again, followed by what sounded like a tree snapping in half. That was by far the craziest day I've had as a park ranger. This happened when I was a ranger at a state park in Florida. I was working the front desk at the park office, and it was a pretty slow night. I had been watching some TV on my computer when all of a sudden I heard something outside that sounded like a person screaming for help. It didn't sound like an animal and it wasn't anything mechanical or man-made. The closest thing I can compare it to is someone screaming as if they were being murdered. My first thought was that someone must be in trouble outside so I grabbed my flashlight and headed out back towards where the screams were coming from. It was coming from behind our maintenance building, which is located near the back entrance of our campground. There are no cabins there, just campsites. When I got there, nothing seemed to miss, but then suddenly, whatever made that noise screamed again. Only this time, it was much closer to me. I walked over to this trailhead, and that's when I see these kids' clothes on the trail folded up nicely. It looked like clothing of a small boy. A white shirt red jeans, and blue shoes all stacked on top of each other. I thought it was odd, but then I heard the screaming again. It was coming from this patch of woods just behind the trailhead where these clothes were. The screaming sounded like it was an adult trying to sound like a child. It had this high-pitched shrillness that made me feel uneasy. I continued on this trail further into the woods, looking for whoever was making this noise, when suddenly something ran past me in my peripheral vision. And as I stood there, I could tell that the screaming was coming from a tape recorder or some type of audio device that was stuck on a loop. At first, I thought maybe someone decided to play some sort of sick joke on me. But that's when I turned around and I got the hell out of there. I went back to the ranger station until my shift ended the following morning. I went back out the next morning and I went to that same trailhead where I found those kids' clothes, and they were gone. My partner and I were called to meet at the ranger station in Oak Mountain State Park. We were Alabama State Troopers, and they needed some help looking for someone. A young man got separated from his hiking group that spring morning, and they had been unable to find him. When we got there, we set up a perimeter and went over things with the rangers and others searching. We headed out to the spot where he was last seen and everyone took off in different directions, calling and searching through the brush on the ground. I was leading a small group of three down one of the trails and spotted something moving in the distance. It was down a ravine off to the side of the path, maybe about 30 feet ahead of us. Our path would take us right by it, but I didn't want to get anyone's hopes up. I simply told everyone to just stop moving. I slowly inched down the path, looking into the brush. I couldn't make out what it was, so, so I called out the young man's name in case it had been him hiding there from some animal or something. The rustling suddenly stopped. I was sure that we found him. I waved off the search party so that we wouldn't overwhelm whoever was in the bushes. I kept getting closer with my hand to my waist just in case a bear or something jumped on me. But then I saw it, two beady black eyes staring out the path directly at me. I froze. It was a large creature. There was a large branch that it was holding onto with one hand. 
human-like but covered in red fur with much longer fingers. The branch stuck out at me like a weapon, as if this creature was warning me to stay back. I wanted to, but I wanted so badly to see exactly what this thing was. Then from over the hill I heard that they had found the young man. I snapped out of my staring contest and started to back up slowly. The creature put down the branch and its hand disappeared into the brush, but I could still see it looking at me. My partner was yelling down for me to hurry up, but I kept backing up slowly until whatever it was turned and crawled away through the brush and further into the ravine. I only saw its eyes and its hand, and I could only imagine how tall it was. I asked the missing young man if he encountered anything. He said that he was being followed by something or someone ever since he got separated from his group. He said that it just kept pushing him away further from his group. He thought it was a bear or some other type of large animal that was stalking him. I was with my partner parked near the entrance to Black Creek State Forest in upstate New York. We were troopers and we had decided to take a short break from driving on the highways to get some clean air. The good thing about working nights was the ability to sometimes just sit and wait for a call from dispatch. In this night, we both had the windows down because it was the beginning of summer. My partner was telling me about her husband's new job and I was talking about my wife's birthday party. And we were just talking and laughing until our radios suddenly became buggy. First it went static and I thought we were getting a call, but then it was becoming more like a squeak or a shriek, and the louder it got, the more aggressive it sounded. We looked at each other and my partner picked up the radio and tried to speak into it. But it sent back such loud interference I thought we were going to go deaf. That's when, above the tree line, we both noticed this bright light coming from the woods, like an extremely bright flashlight. It was white, but not blinding, and it seemed to be pulsating like a heartbeat. At first, we didn't know what to do, but then we realized it was in the middle of the night, so maybe someone was lost in that forest. We started getting out of the car to investigate. I tried to radio again, but it was met with an even louder interference. My ears were ringing, and this time it was outside, so it echoed until it was lost in the air. Whatever it was, it started moving towards us, almost running towards us through the trees in a zigzag pattern. We stopped and pulled our weapons, standing our ground as this thing aggressively shot around from tree to tree. There was no way it was a person, and no animal was carrying this sort of light. My partner backed up and climbed into the vehicle, hitting the radio in the car over and over trying to get it working. More interference came before the light just stopped again in front of us, now behind a row of trees. The light was still pulsing, but above now we could see that it was surrounded by metal. On the very top, it looked like there was a bubble, and in that bubble, I just saw the top of something's head, bald and white. There were no eyes visible or anything. As fast as it appeared in front of our car, it took off straight up into the sky. We saw it hover for a moment, then it just took off and disappeared into the sky with no trail or trace that it had flown away. I got back into the vehicle and my partner was still freaking out. I tried to speak, but there was so much interference coming from the radio. Then the interference stopped. After our ears were covered in silence, we noticed that there were no birds or crickets or anything really making noise. No other cars had passed and we had no idea if anyone else saw what we had just seen. After that, we never parked by that forest again. I just thought others might have seen the same thing, but there were no other reports from that night. I worked as a ranger at a state park in northern Minnesota for several years. I had heard stories from other rangers about strange things they had seen, but until my own encounter, I didn't really believe them. It was late fall and the park really wasn't that busy, so I decided to work an extra day by myself. There were still some campers staying at the far end of the park who hadn't packed up yet, so I decided to go check on them before dark. I drove down past the beach area, 
where there is a small trail that goes into the woods. It's about a half mile hike through the thick pines. As soon as I turned onto this road, something made me stop and listen. It was almost like everything stopped moving around me. There wasn't any wind and it was dead quiet except for one bird chirping off in the distance. Then all of a sudden it stopped too. I started getting this eerie feeling that something wasn't right, so I got out of my truck with my pistol in hand, and I walked down towards where these campers were supposed to be camping. No one was there. The only thing left behind were two Coleman stoves sitting side by side with no tents or people anywhere near them. Then all of a sudden from behind me came this crashing sound from deep within the woods which startled me enough that I ran back to my truck. When I looked back to where the sound was coming from, what appeared to be this giant wolf creature came running out of the trees straight towards me. The animal's stride looked so odd compared to any normal wolf or dog. It was doing a combination of running on all fours and then standing up on its hind legs as it was coming towards me. The animal's fur was a dark brownish black color and seemed to have some sort of mange or scabies type skin condition because it looked very patchy in places, especially around the face area where there were open sore looking spots on its muzzle. I quickly got into my truck and backed out onto the main road. Then when I looked back towards where this creature came from, it had stopped running and now was just standing there watching me. After a few minutes of sitting in my truck with my pistol aimed at this thing, it turned and walked back into the woods. I finally drove back to the main area of the park and told some other rangers about what had happened. And they said, finally, someone else saw it too. I asked them, what did you guys see? And they said, we saw what you saw. They had seen the same wolf-like creature that I had seen, but from a different vantage point. They told me that this thing comes into the park every so often and has been spotted by visitors as well as other rangers. I never saw this animal up close again after that, but there were times when I would hear strange sounds coming from deep within the woods, which sounded like this animal. I was participating in a training program as a rookie ranger at Crater Lake National Park in Oregon. It was certainly a good place to train. Besides the views being beautiful and the various things you could do there, it was also a place with a lot of backcountry hiking, which I was hoping would prepare me for the job. One night, the group had decided to stop and camp along the foothills of Mount Scott near the trailhead. It was a clear summer night, and I was looking forward to this time to enjoy the outdoors rather than trudging through them. The other guys in training with me were fun to be around, and we spent a good portion of the night sharing stories we had heard about the park. It was a notorious place for weird occurrences. Of course, this didn't bother me. I believe in those sort of things. So going to bed after a few hours of storytelling was fine for me as I curled up in my sleeping bag around midnight. I woke up around 3 in the morning to an almost pitch black sky. I had to use the bathroom, which was probably the only thing I dreaded about that entire trip. I had decided to take a quick walk to a bush about 30 feet from where we had set up camp. I turned my back to the camp and did my business, not really thinking about it. I zipped up my pants and turned around only to see that I could no longer spot the campsite. I laughed at first. Of course, I would do something like this and get lost in the dark. I started heading in the most likely direction, but things were beginning to look new and not familiar. I had only been walking for about 15 minutes when I realized I had no idea where I was. I tried to retrace my steps, but it was no use. I was lost. I wandered for hours trying to find my way back, but it was useless. I was getting tired and dehydrated, and I knew I needed to find help. It was still dark as I rummaged through brush and found myself climbing hills rather than getting to where I was supposed to be. It felt like the darkness raged on forever and I was beginning to feel weak. Finally, I had to stop walking and climbing. It was like I had been doing this for days. Dawn came and I was relieved. I could see better now and find my way back. 
But as the sun rose, I realized that I was now in an entirely different location. I was on the other side of the mountain. I had climbed up in the night without realizing it and was now in an area that I've never been before. I was disoriented and confused. I had no idea where I was or how to get back. I started to panic and I knew I needed to find help soon. I decided to build a fire thinking that maybe someone would see the smoke. I gathered wood and started a fire, but it was no use. No one came. It was so odd to me that it remained dark, and I wasn't sure if I would even see dawn. It shouldn't have been that far off. I was sure I had been going for quite a few hours at this point. I figured I should get back up and try to start down the mountain, hoping that if I got lower, I would be able to see something familiar. I came across a creek, which I was sure was on the other side of where we camped and stopped to drink and rest. Beside the creek is where I lost my energy completely, even newly rehydrated. There was no sun and I was sure now that I had gone miles and miles. Nothing made sense to me except to close my eyes and wait to die. The next thing I knew, the lead ranger from our group was shaking me awake. It was morning and I was still beside the creek. The lead ranger asked me what I was thinking hiking so far on my own. I told him it had only been a few hours and that I was just lost after using the bathroom. The ranger laughed. I had not only gotten to the other side of the mountain, but I had been missing for three days. They had no idea how I got there, and I was just as confused. I had no recollection of the path I took after I left to use the bathroom. The only thing I knew was that I was extremely tired. I went back to sleep at the ranger station and slept for hours. I was a ranger at Crater Lake, one of the most popular and oldest national parks in the country. I took a lot of pride in my job, especially when it was used to help those in need. There was one particular time many years ago at the beginning of my time there that really got me. It was late spring and the park was getting busy. We encouraged a lot of people coming in to be prepared for the hikes, as they could get very strenuous. A mother and her small child, a girl about six, came to the ranger station to get a map of the trails, and we warned the mother that the child may get a little worn out. The mother seemed okay with that, saying that she would only go as far as the girl could handle. Off they went, and I went about my day. Sometime later that afternoon, we got a call from a ranger on patrol. The little girl had wandered off the trail and disappeared. I kept my cool and got into my car to join the other ranger in searching while we waited for the search and rescue to show up. Far up the trail, I found them, the ranger and the hysterical mother. She was going on and on about how thirsty the girl had gotten and then she caught a glimpse of something shiny off the path. The mother believed that the child thought it was a waterfall or something. I looked in the direction she was talking about. There was no way any light got into the trees enough for it to look like water, and there was nothing that could reflect. I was stumped, but I kept it to myself, and off we went to the beginning to look for her. We called out her name a few times. It was met with silence at first. Then I thought I saw something shiny off in the distance, but I thought it was crazy. It was so dark under the canopy but I decided to go check it out. As I got closer, the shining light sort of zipped away in the air and then disappeared. I noticed that while this was happening, there was no noises from anything around me. The silence was almost deafening. Then all at once, the woods came alive with birds and all these noises. Then there was a small noise not familiar to the woods. It sounded like a small sob. I walked closer to where I had seen the shiny thing and noticed I was pretty much walking into a really thick and tall tree, but the sobs were louder. I had no idea where it could have been coming from, so I called out the little girl's name again. Suddenly, I hear, I'm here, from above. I looked up into this very tall tree and there she was, the little girl, at least 50 feet off the ground. The girl was stuck and terrified. I couldn't get her down by myself and the mother was in no condition to help. We radioed our own station and got through to search and rescue. Once they found us, a few moments later, they got her down safely. 
She didn't have a scratch or a speck of dirt on her. She was a little cold, but other than that, she was perfectly healthy and fine. The mother thanked me profusely, and I just told her that it was my job. But that day really stuck with me. I never really could guess what that shiny thing was or how the girl ended up in the tree. There was nothing for her to even hold on to in order to climb it. And when she was asked about what happened, she had nothing to say really. Just that she would never walk off again. It was one of the craziest things that ever happened to me. And it just goes to show that you never know what can happen in the wilderness. I was a search and rescue ranger in Oregon. A lot of the calls I answered were at Crater Lake National Park. It was also known for a lot of weird activity, but I personally didn't ever run into any. It was the usual. People wandered the wrong way, got a little lost, and we were notified that they didn't return to their home or campsite. Then we would just go out and look for them. This one call, however, was startling and changed how I looked at the park. A partner and I were called in on a search for a hiker in one of the steepest backcountry trails in the park. I figured this would be quick, that he was just tired and wandered off course. As we searched the area though, we came up with no trace of the man and he was not answering any calls we made. It looked like it would take longer than expected. All we could hear were birds chirping. We were told to watch out for some mountain lions and bears, so I was beginning to worry that this guy was a victim of a wild animal. Sad, but it does happen occasionally. We continued combing the area on this steep hill along the path when I realized in the distance there was a drop-off point. Was there something on the other side of it, I thought. I made my way ahead of my partner to the top of this hill and I looked down into what was a crevasse in the rock before another clearing. Inside the crevasse was a man curled up in a ball shivering. He had his eyes open. He looked filthy. My partner and I lowered ourselves down to help the man, but he became inconsolable. He was thrashing about and trying to get our hands off him. He was yelling about something. I couldn't make out what he was saying. We finally got him to calm down enough to tell us what had happened. He said he was out for a hike and when he saw something watching him from the bushes, he didn't know what it was, but it looked hungry. He described only seeing something pale and slimy looking, almost human-like, but hunched over. He couldn't see much else but the mouth, which is what clued him into the thing's hunger. Apparently, it was layered with dripping saliva, like it was staring at a pork roast. He ran as fast as he could, but it chased him. He didn't know how he made it to the crevasse, but he hid in there, hoping the creature wouldn't find him. He said he could still hear it searching for him, growling. It sounded like it ran on two legs and the noises it made weren't animal or human. He thought for sure he was going to die. We tried to get him to come out, but he was too terrified. He said he wasn't coming out until he knew that creature was gone. We called for backup and more rangers came. We set up a perimeter and waited. It was getting dark and the man was still hiding in the crevasse. We heard rustling in the bushes and everyone tensed up. Something was coming towards us. It was a deer. We all let out a breath and laughed. The man, however, was still hiding. We tried to get him to come out, but he still refused. We had no choice but to forcibly remove him, but that really pissed him off. Out of the crevasse, he just took off running, leaving his pack and such behind. We never saw him again, and I never saw what he was talking about, but he was so afraid it was hard not to believe him. I was pulling an overnight shift searching for a woman who had gone missing in the mountains around Crater Lake. We had been told she was last seen making it to the trailhead, but she never came out of the woods. Her husband had called in the missing persons report, stating she never came home from her solo hiking trip. That was around 3 in the afternoon. We were fast approaching midnight and decided that we may need to wind down until the next day. That's when we heard some bushes rustling along the trail. We all turned on our flashlights at the same time and pointed them in the direction of the noise. There we saw a woman drenched in sweat with a crazed look in her eyes. She immediately started ranting and raving about how we were following her. 
how we were part of some sort of conspiracy. She was babbling incoherently, and we couldn't get her to calm down. Eventually, we had to subdue her and carry her back to the ranger station because she wouldn't leave on her own. On her way down to the car, she kept turning around and looking behind us. She was hyperventilating. She was mumbling to herself. We put her in the back of our pickup truck because she refused to get in willingly, and we needed to get off the mountain quickly. It was getting even later, and honestly, we wanted her safe and for all of us to go home. As we were driving, she started screaming and slamming on the back of the pickup. She was yelling behind us into the wilderness, screaming, Don't follow me, and stop. She would turn to one of us in the back with her and beg to be let go so she could go hide. She was insistent that there were creatures in the woods following us. She said they wanted to hurt us all. There was danger everywhere and they wanted her too, but she had escaped them for now. I asked her what creatures, but it only made things worse. She went ballistic again and started clamoring for the back of the truck to jump out. We stopped her, of course, but as the truck went on and we held her down, I looked in the direction she was talking about and noticed something alongside the trail, not far from the truck. It appeared like something was trying to keep up with us. I kept my mouth shut, though. I didn't want to make it worse. Eventually, we got back down the mountain safely and brought her to the ranger station. Her husband had to come get her because she was too jittery to drive. I didn't say a word about it to anyone, but she kept saying to me over and over, you saw it, didn't you? I would just tell her to relax and that her husband was on the way. When they pulled away, I was standing outside and waving at them as they went. I remember feeling paranoid about staying outside, even for another second longer than necessary, even though we were at the ranger station property. What I saw following us alongside the trail was something I didn't even think was possible or of this world. It was this massive black dog, like this werewolf type creature, but it looked way more sinister. I've heard of hellhounds before and that's the first thing that came to my mind as I watched this thing run after us as it stared at me in the back of the truck. It was truly terrifying. I don't know if I was seeing things or if this was real, but it's no wonder why this lady was half out of her mind if this thing was chasing her.